nothing more rewarding or delicious than making your own sourdough on a regular basis. The only challenge is figuring out how to make it sustainable in your lifestyle because let's face it, bread making takes time and energy. I have been making my own whole wheat sourdough bread on a regular basis for several years now. And the reason why I've been able to make it sustainable in my lifestyle is that I've taken most of the rules for bread making and I have thrown them right into the bin. And so in this video, I'm going to teach you the lazy person's way of making the absolute best light and fluffy whole wheat sourdough loaf. So the first thing that you're going to need to start off with is a starter. These are reasonably easy to make and it takes about a week. And there are a lot of wonderful instructions online for that. I have linked the one that I use to make this starter in the description box below. I have had this particular starter for several years now, and it's really, really, really easy to maintain. Standard advice for starter maintenance is a little bit complicated. That requires measuring certain ratios of water to flour, giving it regular feeds, and making sure that you reactivate your starter about a day before you make a loaf. I don't have the time, energy, or attention span to do any of that, and yet I still make really excellent loaves on a regular basis. So let me tell you what I've been doing to keep this bad boy alive and kicking for the last four years. The first rule that I break is that I never feed my starter before making bread. I'm pretty sure that my starter would never pass the float test because it's never actually that fresh. And the reason why I don't do that is because, well, typically your starter is going to be fed and start becoming active within a day of making bread. So why on earth would I waste some of my starter to get that going if I'm just going to be fermenting the bread for that long anyway? I might as well allow the starter to reactivate in my loaf. And I find that for me personally, this actually makes a more sour sourdough than if I were using a fresh starter. Typically, I only feed my starter after I've made a loaf of bread. And if I'm gonna be perfectly honest, I actually don't feed my starter every single time I make bread. I usually will make enough starter to fill this jar, which is usually enough to make two different batches of bread. So I really only feed this every other time that I make bread. And that brings me to the second rule that I break, and that is that I don't measure flour and water at a specific ratio when I'm feeding my starter. All I do is eyeball the amount of flour and water so that the mixture turns out to be roughly the same consistency as pancake batter. Because in my experience, it doesn't really matter what ratio you use, the starter is going to regulate itself. If there's too much water, what's gonna happen is the starter will settle to the bottom and they'll have liquid over the top. And then I can just pour it out or potentially mix it back in when I'm going to bake. And if I don't use quite enough, then it's a little bit thick and all I need to do is add a little bit of extra water to thin it out. I have found that regardless of the amount of water and flour I use, it doesn't actually change the stability of my starter and it doesn't change the quality of the bread. So when I go to make a loaf of sourdough, the first thing I do is add all my dry ingredients to a bowl. And typically for whole wheat dough, the only ingredients that I'm adding there is 100% whole wheat flour. I also add a little bit of gluten because this really improves the texture and quality of the bread because whole wheat flour tends to be a little bit lower in gluten than typical white bread flour. I also add salt. Next, I add warm water and a little bit of my starter. I typically don't measure the amount of starter that I'm using because again, I don't wanna dirty any additional utensils that I'm going to have to wash later. And this is the next rule that I break. And this is probably a controversial one, but I actually never measure the amount of water or flour that I'm using. And for me, this is a big part of what makes bread making sustainable because I find that whipping out a food scale or dirtying measuring cups ends up becoming a large barrier to me baking at all. Instead, if I could just throw stuff in and decide how much water and flour I wanna use based on feel, the dough making process goes a lot faster and I'm a lot more likely to engage in it. Now, if you're not used to bread making, I would encourage you to measure for the first couple of times so you get a sense of how a well hydrated loaf feels. But then if you can stop measuring, it is going to reduce the amount of time it takes to make dough. I'm sure that experienced bread makers are probably cringing at this one because they're probably assuming that my loaves are very inconsistent bake to bake. And I would say that's probably true a little bit in the beginning, but honestly, the variation is not as big as you might think. And if doing it this way makes it more likely that I'm actually going to bake bread, I view that as being a big win. Rule number four that I break, and I will say that this is very specific to 100% whole wheat loaves, is that I don't need it. I only mix it enough so that there's no dry flour, and typically the dough when I'm done mixing it is very shaggy, sticky, and gloopy. And the reason why I do that is because when you over mix whole wheat dough, the fiber from the whole wheat flour will break apart the gluten strands, and in my experience, it creates a denser dough. So the less that you need it, typically the spongier, lighter, and less dense your loaf is gonna be. 
Which is awesome if you're somebody who doesn't have a lot of time and doesn't really want to be kneading dough for ages. This particular tip probably will fall apart if you are using white flour in your dough though, so keep that in mind. So once all the dry flour has been incorporated and I have a nice shaggy dough, I just cover it with a dish towel and I place it in a very high traffic area of the house. And the reason I do this is because the next step is going to be to turn the bread by just doing a stretch and fold method about three or four times over the next couple hours. And I don't use a timer to figure out when to do this step. I just do it every time I pass by this area of my house and I notice the bread there and that prompts me to remember to just give it a quick turn. With each successive turn, you will notice that your dough is becoming a lot more pliable and elastic and a lot less shaggy and sticky. Because I work from home, I typically start my bread making process in the morning and I just turn it throughout the day as I walk past it. And at the end of the day, I just take the dough and stick it in the refrigerator to do a cold ferment overnight. Now, if you don't work from home, you can either do this on the weekend or you could consider doing a different 24 hour cycle where you start the bread in the evening, you turn it a few times before you go to bed, and then in the morning before you go to work, you would stick it in the refrigerator until you come home and you're ready to bake. The next morning or whenever I'm ready to bake my loaves, all I do is take it out of the refrigerator and I divide the loaves in two because as I mentioned before, I always make two loaves and I shape my loaves like so. I don't have fancy bread proofing baskets, so all I do is I take a high sided bowl like this put a dish towel in it and give it a little bit of flour before plopping my loaf face down in the bowl. While those are getting to room temperature, I preheat my oven. I bake my loaves in Dutch ovens because I find it makes the best crust. But if you don't have one, you can create a similar effect by putting a small pan of water in your oven, which just creates steam and improves the quality of crust. For 100% whole wheat dough, I find that it works best to bake it at a lower temperature. So I typically bake my loaves around 390, 400. The reason for that is because even though the way I make it does create a much spongier, springier, airier loaf, it is still denser than a white loaf and it has less air pockets to generate steam and cook it on the inside. So I find that when I cook whole wheat sourdough at a higher temperature, what tends to happen is that the inside is not thoroughly cooked and the bottom of the bread is burnt. So if you are cooking with 100% whole wheat, I would encourage you to experiment with some lower oven temperatures. Once the ovens are preheated, I just turn the loaves out onto parchment paper, give them a little slash on top, and plop them into my Dutch ovens to bake covered for about 35 minutes. After 35 minutes, I remove the lids and I bake them for an additional 15. Once you take your loaves out of the oven, I would highly encourage you to be patient and wait for your loaves to fully cool because if you cut into them when you're hot, you're actually taking a little bit of the bake time out of the center of the bread and it can result in a little bit more of a squishy gummy loaf. And so there you have it. That is an easy way to make 100% whole wheat loaves that is light, springy, airy, and doesn't take a ton of manual effort. Are these the absolute most beautiful, perfect, and consistent loaves every single time? No, probably not, but it is a damn good loaf and this method is easy enough that it's something that I can do consistently because it really only takes about five minutes of prep time on the day that I make the dough and just a couple minutes of active time on the next day when I'm doing the bake.